purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at purposely.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast. My name is Nathan Sutherland, and this podcast is dedicated to helping families love God and use tech. Today, we are continuing our conversation about using tech well, uh, specifically tech boundaries that we all need. The first one was around time. And just for a quick reminder on that, we talked about uh, with time, the time of day, uh, the total amount of time we spend, and how many times we're going to do it. Uh, and there was a reflection question where I use this term jots, this idea that there's little chunks of time that we're using deliberately. Uh, and just how are we going to use our 48 jots? If you broke your day down into 30-minute chunks, how many of those jots would be spoken for with just sleep and then with you know normal life activities? And how many do you get to deliberately place and is your tech reflecting accurately your values, your priorities, and your calling? So then today we're going to talk about location, which I will tell you up front, I thought was just going to be slam dunk, don't use it in the bedroom, and walk away. And I was like, man, it's going to be like a six-minute episode. It's the best. And then I started writing it. I was like, oh, that's not quite going the same way I thought. And then it kept going. I was like, oh, no. I ended up with one of those episodes that was a bit of a behemoth. So I've clamped it down, took a little longer than I expected. But today, the conversation is on location. Uh, where do we use our tech? And I'm, I want to be a little more nuanced than just give you some prescriptive yay nays. I actually want to talk about three things. I want to talk about safety. I want to talk about community. And I want to talk about modeling healthy tech. I believe those are the three parts. When we talk about where do we use our tech, that's what we need to be thinking of. We need to think about the big picture safety, and we'll we'll go into what that means. It's not just don't look at porn. It's how do we use tech well and deliberately, uh, and then community, which is I believe one of the major things to be gained from uh, from using tech locations rightly. And then third is modeling healthy tech. That this is actually something we are engaging as part of this winning conversation overall, this relational win as parents, where we go in and don't just drop new rules or drop overall rules and say, hey, now that tech is only in this spot, we're fine. Never speak of it again. Instead, we're talking about the why. Hey, we're going to use this tech and we're going to make sure it's used here because A, B, and C. Uh, it's not, I, we'll get to it. I don't want to steal my own thunder, but we're going to start with this with safety. <clears throat> and this is I think number one on all of your minds, so I thought I would bring it up. Uh, the safety goes content strangers, bullies, in that order. The reason we need to pick an intentional location to use our technology is because there are some locations that are just not safe, especially when the tech itself might be fighting us on good decisions. So you have tool tech, you have drool tech. If there's technology on the tool side that's helping us create, then it's only doing what we say. But there are technologies that encourage us to maybe try one more thing. Uh, this is anything with an algorithm, anything with a feed, anything with other people's content that is suggested to us. That kind of technology can be as simple as, a, as an e-reader or as an Audible account. You're still getting suggestions of, hey, have you read this book? Have you listened to the story? Have you thought about this song? Uh, you're getting feeds. The content safety is concerning. This is from, so 2023 study, so it came out this year. Uh, but on the previous year, this is a quote from Common Sense Media, uh, said there are many risks of social media, including exposure to harmful content, bullying and drama, unwanted contact by strangers, negative social comparisons, and interference with sleep. So we talk about the content we're engaging, and it cites a pair of uh, 2018 and 2021 research studies saying, hey, the content matters because it can affect sleep, certainly, but you have bullying, you have drama, you have unwanted contact from uh, from strangers. So it's not just, again, I said, started out with this. Don't just go look at uh, unsafe and immoral pictures of people. It's the content we engage also exposes us to all sorts of other harms. So we want to make sure our location is deliberate for the content safety. But one of that, that last piece uh, where it's a unwanted contact by strangers, let me drill into that a little bit. <laughs> so later in this study, uh, or this is 2023, national survey of youth, more than 50% of girls said they had unwanted contact from strangers through social media. 
So if we know that 90% of teens have regular access to the internet, that something like three quarters of teens are on social media. When your children say, everybody's on it, they're not wrong. Everyone's on it. And of those three quarters, <coughs> excuse me, 50% of those kids are saying they're on it almost constantly. And that's, again, not hyperbolic. Uh, they are on there every few minutes, if you were to look at the amount of time that they're covering in the waking hours. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're spending 16 straight hours, but they're going to be every few minutes, they're going to be checking it. They're going to be engaging it somehow. This statistic is concerning. Uh, the majority of girls, this is a quote now, the majority of girls who use Instagram, 58%, and Snapchat, 57%, say they've been contacted by a stranger on these platforms in ways that make them uncomfortable. On TikTok, the number is 46%. So on the three major platforms, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, for girl users, 58%, 57%, 46% have been contacted by someone they don't know in a way that made them uncomfortable. This is the reason we need a location because that happens in a bedroom, that happens in a private space. That child is probably just gonna close the app, walk away, feel bad, but be like, like nothing happened. And I don't want my parents to freak out and think that I did something wrong that brought this on me, right? So I'm just not gonna say anything. And if you look at the mental health stats of young ladies, well, two thirds of them are would say in the last year they've dealt with prolonged bouts of sadness and isolation. One third of them would say that they had dealt with ideas of taking their own lives, suicidal ideation. This is from a 2022 research piece, but on 2021. Um, we are finding that social media is a direct causal link to this. Uh, it's not maybe the only cause, but more social media time means less mental health. Um, and this is why we need it in a public space. It's perfectly reasonable to say, my child needs it or my child wants it. They've shown faithfulness in little things. I've decided to take this calculated risk. Make sure the location is safe for the content because the content impacts them emotionally and there are unhealthy and unsafe strangers on there in that content uh, that they're engaging. Third reason, safety has to do with location is bullies. Um, nearly half, this is also from uh, the same research piece, nearly half, 45% of girls who use TikTok say they feel addicted to the platform. And one in three girls who use Snapchat feel daily pressure. So I point this out because when we think bullies, we think mean kids on the street, right? Like kid, typically when I was growing up, bullies meant this is a kid that beat you up. Uh, that was a bully. And then we're like, you know what? That's not exactly true. Bullies have an unfair uh, advancement in power and they use it repeatedly uh, outside of a relationship, outside of consent. Meaning someone has said, you need to stop, but you don't have to because you have the power in this relationship. And so you continue this behavior that is bullying. And that's exactly what these devices and apps do sometimes. Uh, keep this in mind, the bully doesn't have to be a mean kid in class or a stranger danger out there on the internet. A bully can be the actual program or device we're using because it doesn't quit. It doesn't care. It doesn't take breaks and say, you know what? You seem like you're anxious. Why don't we just take 10 and walk away? It goes, oh, you're anxious? What about this feed? What about this person? What about this message? What about this idea? What about this news feed? And it gives you that next thing because engagement is its only goal. Its goal is to take your time, focus, money. And sometimes technology is the bully. You've told it to stop and it still sends you a notification. You told it to stop and it still showed you another feed. It doesn't care about your mental health or your well-being and location is so important because you can get eyes on the prize, parents. You can see, hey, my kid's using this technology. I can see the screen. I can see the kid. Things are going okay. And you can see behavioral changes. You can see the kids set down the device and walk away. And if they look flush, if they look dis, uh, disgruntled, if they look out of sorts, you're the loving conversation piece to find out what's happening. Not to blame their tech, not to drop the hammer, not to teach them a lesson, uh, but to say, hey, let's say your child just made a mistake and it was on purpose and you witness the aftermath. Be the first person in on that. Be the loving one to say, hey, what's going on? Nothing, it's fine, it's good. Hey, what, did something happen online? Is someone being unkind? Is everything all right? And you can pull that thread. Maybe your child wants to shell up, but sometimes we just want someone to ask because initiating is so difficult. So location is important for safety because safety, uh, we want safe content. We want safety from strangers, safety from bullies, which is sometimes the very device they're using is going to bully them into. Using One in three users of Snapchat 
feel like they have to. Sometimes that's FOMO, but it's designed fear of missing out, FOMO. Uh, sometimes it's designed in there. Snap streaks are literally designed FOMO. It's behavioral psychology 101. We're gonna get your friends roped into this. We're gonna keep a streak going. Don't you dare miss out on a message your friend sent you, even though it was the bottom of their nose while they were eating a sandwich at lunch. It's not meaningful. There's no personal connection, but you better not let that streak die, uh, which is also why Snapchat now lets you buy back your streaks. That's right, everyone. Your child might be using streaks and have like a young man that I met, met uh, this last year, had a streak of 1,400. And he was a middle schooler. He'd been doing this since fourth grade. Every single day, he's kept a snap streak alive with a friend. And if it expires, don't worry. Before Snapchat tells your friend, hey, you know what? We're back to zero because I missed a 24-hour period without messaging you back. They'll send the offender a note and say, psst, no one has to know. For just a small amount of money, you can buy your streak back and save your friendship. And that, my friends, is why there may be a little anxiety about using it. And by the way, Snapchat is a bully. Snapchat makes its money off being a bully. It is not providing a service anyone's asked for. Zero people ask for direct messages with a timer. No one wanted that feature. And yet we use it and our kids use it. And it is a, it is a rough spot. So make sure that you are keeping that technology in a place that is a good decision for your family. All right. So that was number one, was <laughs> safety. Uh, number two is community. And this one is shorter, but I love this quote from Andy Crouch. Uh, this is The Life We're Looking For, his second book on technology. The first one is The TechWise Family that I referenced last week. Uh, but on community, I love this. What technology wants, this is his quote, what technology wants is really what mammon wants. And he's referencing uh, the statement Jesus makes that we cannot serve two masters. We can't serve both God and mammon, which is translated money, but mammon has this, as he does a great job of pointing out, mammon has this undertone of not just money because we, we need you know currency to buy groceries. It's money because money is what you can leverage for self-reliance. Mammon is talking about that ability to build our own kingdom on our terms. And that is absolutely what technology promises us. So he says what technology wants is really what mammon wants. A world of context-free, responsibility-free, dependence-free power measured out in fungible, sortable units of value. And to make that into just a shorter idea is that what keeping tech public does for us is it allows us to resist that desire to get drawn into uh, isolation, into impersonal experiences, into hedonistic distractions that pull us away from God's glory and joy and the reality of being known and knowing God fully, uh, the thing we were designed for, presence, that the reason we need to be concerned about our location is because, one, safety, two, community. When the internet becomes our community, that community is often um, convenient. We can get there, snap up a button, we can connect with people, doesn't matter who they are. They don't have to be the same people because we're all here and we're all connecting. And because it's convenient, it becomes disposable. And that's a, a wise insight from my friend, Sean. Uh, thank you, Sean, for, for, for bringing my eyes to that. Uh, that is a very poignant point for us to reflect on when we talk about the community of technology. Can it build community? Absolutely. But typically when it's rooted in community, we met or rooted in technology. When our community started because of technology, it meets through technology and its common action is technology. Then as soon as technology is not at the core, we actually don't have a lot to roll on. Uh, we don't have any ability to meet in real life. We don't have the ability to know each other fully. And when life hits the fan, we become inconvenient and they slide someone else into the squad, slide someone else into the conversation, slide someone else into the project. Uh, we want to make sure that our community is being extended by our technology, not distracted by it. Uh, so third and finally, the reason we are putting location at the top of this conversational uh, hierarchy is uh, we want to model healthy tech. We want to help our children see that tech can be used well, even drool tech, even tool tech. Uh, that location is important for that, though. <clears throat> so, <laughs> excuse me. The first thing you're modeling by having a location is healthy boundaries. Uh, you are building a family tech framework, as it were, uh, of, hey, you know what? This is how we use technology. And then it goes away in these other places. Um, 
John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, addresses this idea. Sometimes they're called spiritual disciplines. John Mark Comer likes to call them his rules of life. But the idea is you're going to accomplish something with little intentional choices that you couldn't accomplish just by deciding in a moment. So you can't just say, today I'm going to have healthy tech. Go. Like, what does that mean? Are you just not going to use tech? Like, you're just going to use all the tech, but just make sure it never goes south? Like, anyone who's used tech in any format for amount of, any amount of time knows that it goes south, that you need loving boundaries. So I've told you before about my very dumb smartphone. Like I'm recording this on my very dumb smartphone, but there's no app store because I asked a friend to say, hey, can you put a password on this? So I don't have an app store because I don't need that kind of distraction. I have common eyes under the only browser that I own so that two other people always see what I do online, not because I'm struggling right now with some kind of, um, I mean, lifelong psychopathic self-destructive behavior, but because I like making good decisions and I make more good decisions when my location digitally is also on the phones of two other people, right? Like when my search habits show up on two people who care about me's phones, that was a weird way to say it, but on the phones of two people who care about me, it's easier to make the good decisions I already wanted to make. So I do that. Uh, similar with our young people, we're showing them this disciplines. Well, how are you going to accomplish following Christ in a tech world, you're going to make little disciplines. Location is going to be one of those. Let's teach you how to, the idea here is we're not just raising safe kids, we're raising, raising healthy adults. And that is very much what we want to do here. Uh, Andy Crouch goes on this. And this is a nuance, but I think it's worth hearing. <clears throat> Location helps us manage the type of tech we're using. I've talked before on the design side, tool and drool tech. That is how the tech is wired to work. Dual track tech helps you create. It does not care how often or how much. Drool tech is designed to help you consume, and it does care. It wants more of your time, your focus, your money, and it, that's why it can bully you. That's why Snapchat is so successful financially and so terrible, and it's designed for minors. <clears throat> so what we're looking at then is Andy Crouch's ideas. All right, but there actually comes not just on the design side, but our intent in using it side. And his quote, uh, or I'll... Big picture first, and then his quote. Uh, the big picture is there's devices and instruments. So there are devices which help us establish dominion in our world. It's that mammon mentality. I'm going to use this, and I'm going to project myself more effectively on reality. And this is email, right? Like, this is how we can misuse email. When I misuse email, it's not because um, it's designed to be misused. It's because it's so convenient, and I can just do that one more thing, and I can get something done. Uh, versus... Uh, something instrumental extends our capacity to um, be amazed by God and his creation and the world that we're in. So it would literally, I'll, I'll read his quote. So he says, uh, Andy Crouch, this is from the, uh, the life we're looking for. Uh, Instruments expand the capacity of human beings without shrinking other parts of us. They extend our capacities by further developing our hearts, souls, mind, and strength. And he uses the example of a telescope. The telescopes are tools. They're run by computers. They see light we can't even see. But they draw wonder at the universe we live in. And so the science, same scientist, the same astronomer who studied those stars can then walk outside and using that instrument does not detract from his or her ability to look up at the stars and go, Whoa, right? In fact, it extends. You now see things that your eye can't see, but you know are there. And it's that much more amazing. Uh, that would be an example of an instrument. Location helps us manage instrument versus device because we're going to see the, the way the reset pivots. If you watch your child Im, uh, imploding in their relationships and responsibilities, their emotions, their sleep, their enjoyment, their time, location is going to be key to that. Uh, it, you're going to be able to watch behavioral changes and go, you know what? Seems like that tech is all right, but you're using it like a device, not an instrument. Let's pivot. Uh, the locations that we really need to think about, there's just kind of this gray, uh, there's a bunch of gray, but some gray areas, commutes, sibling sporting events, going to the store, unstructured time at home. I know it's not a specific location, but when you come home, you have that all right, we didn't make anything for this time. We've got 90 minutes before our next thing. What do we do? Uh, doctor's offices, family meals, bedrooms. Uh, we have physical locations and also allotments of time that I'm lumping into this location piece. Uh, and the conversation as a family isn't just never use tech in the car or never use it during downtime. It's, hey, 
when are we going to go to this location and where are we physically going to use this technology for safety, for community, and for modeling intentional tech use that's going to carry on into adulthood? Um, I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, Anna's book, The Graceful Disconnect, this is just right, first thing you're going to run into, page seven. Uh, she has this challenge to reclaim car time. And I love the way she thinks about it. So I'll throw this out here for you. Uh, the car is a space where we default to isolation. What if instead it became a place for conversation and connection? And I think that challenge is a beautiful picture of what I'm trying to get at when we talk about location today, uh, that we are talking about how do we not just avoid bad things, but how do we claim the best of our home, of our time together with our family so that we extend rather than uh, condense our safety, our um, community and our engagement with one another, our ability to be present and our modeling of healthful intentional tech use. Uh, when we use that mindset, we could actually see that um, watching a movie as a family where everyone's present and everyone's engaged could be more beneficial than a family meal together where everyone's on a personal device. Think about that. Uh, that it's how we're applying this. It's the location, but it's also the intent. So the conversation here is not just get your tech right and make sure you don't use it in bad spots. Uh, but instead it's, hey, how can we use this well? There's a time when drool tech could be more effective than tool tech in modeling and connecting with our children uh, if it's done rightly. Uh, whereas some you could only use tool tech, but you could still misuse it. Okay, third and final thing I wanted to get to here. Um, and just for the sake of time, we'll end on this, um, is the challenge that as we're looking at all of this, uh, there are three simple locational wins we can get that it, at the end of the day, if you're thinking about your technology, something to talk out with your family, talk out with your spouse, reflect and pray on yourself is, um, do I really need technology in my bedroom? Uh, and by technology, I'm specifically talking about tech that is drool tech capable, but really device technology using Andy Crouch's term. Technology that you're using to extend your own abilities. It's work related, it's distraction related, it's project related. It's not gonna bring peace and rest and relationship. Um, do you need that in your bedroom? Do you need that at family meals? And do you need it in car time? Uh, Andy Crouch elsewhere says that it takes seven minutes. Actually, he's citing uh, Sherry Turkle from her book, uh, Reclaiming Conversation. But seven minutes to start a conversation that Anna cites actually later in that quote. Uh, seven minutes to start a conversation. Can we reclaim some car time? Maybe it's just on the way to school, maybe just on the way back, whatever it might be. Can we do that? That's my challenge for you today as we think about the, the boundaries we need around our technology and specifically location so that we can have uh, safety in all the areas that technology relates to that so that we can have community and belonging and so that we can model healthy tech for our kids. Uh, if this is helpful for you, would you uh, share it with someone who might be able to benefit from it? Uh, if you want more resources, you can go to gospelcenteredtech.com. Gospel Center Tech, the book, is out. Anna's book, The Devotional uh, for Moms and Dads, uh, The Graceful Disconnect, is out. You can go gospelcenteredtech.com to check that out. Or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Love God Use Tech. Uh, and join us next week as we continue this conversation about how we can love God and use tech.